Welcome to the How to Code Well podcast. My name is Peter Fisher. I'm a freelance web developer and the host and coding teacher at How to Code Well. Before the show starts, I just want to say a massive thank you to all of the Patreon supporters for supporting this channel and the podcast through these difficult times. If you want to be a supporter, please go to patreon.com forward slash how to code well. Your support is much appreciated. And of course, never miss an episode. Go to howtocodewell.fm to see the previous episodes. Okay, let's get on with the show. Hello, coders, and welcome to another How to Code Well podcast. Today, what I want to talk about is my approach to working on legacy applications or in fact, taking over legacy applications. I'm a freelance developer and in my time, I've had the opportunity and I've done so, taken over applications or rebuilt applications or worked and maintained legacy applications. What I want to talk about today is the different approaches that I've taken and also the tools that I've used to audit the code. Now, this is in no way, shape or form a way of generating blame culture. I'm not looking to have a go at a developer for doing it in such a way. What I want is a a level of confidence and insight as well into the code. I want to find all the nitty gritty areas of the code in a way that is automated and I get reports justification as to my confidence level of the code. We all know that certain projects are really complicated, overly complicated sometimes. We all have that gut feeling, but what I like is to use ways to audit that code and give me reports to justify that feeling. So the first thing I do, obviously, when I get the get a project is that I gain access to the code base, to the assets, to the database. I need those things. So this could come in the form of SSH keys. This could be usernames and passwords, that kind of stuff. The code could be hosted on GitLab, GitHub, Bitbucket, all over the place. It could even be just a zip file or something that I have to pull down an archive from somewhere. So once you've got access, you want to create an environment on your local machine that is nice and clean, like a test lab, if you will, where you're going to download that code to. The reason why I try and keep it nice and clean is because I basically want to start on a clean slate. I don't want other project configuration interfering with this setup. So for example, if you're a PHP developer, you've probably got a PHP any file somewhere and you don't want those particular arguments, those flags, those options that you've set for other projects to interfere with this one. So what I tend to use is a VPS or a virtual server somewhere, or even a Docker machine that I can use as my sort of a testing environment. So once I've got the environment set up, once I've downloaded the code and the database and the assets and all of that stuff, sometimes that can take a long time depending on the size of those things. Once that's done, there's a tendency to just try and install everything as as fast as possible and try and get into the weeds as quickly as possible. What I and that's how I used to do it, but now I, I try and take a step back and request documentation. Um, this isn't just in the form of readme files, but this is also in the form of access maybe to a bug tracker, to any kind of uh, diagrams, class diagrams, any kind of issue reports, that kind of thing. I want to kind of get as much information as possible. Information, after all, is power, right? So you want to make sure that you are you have as much information as you possibly can do about the project without obviously being completely overwhelmed, but you you just want to know that if you see an acronym in the code, you know what that means, that kind of thing. Also, some of this documentation, which could be high level stuff, could also give you an indication as to the different features in the application, that kind of stuff. Okay, so you've got the code, you've got the assets, you've got the database, you've got the documentation, it's time to install it. So 
It might have uh, PHP packages that need to be installed via Composer. It could have JavaScript packages that need to be installed via NPM or Yarn or, or what have you. So you want to make sure that you have the relevant log files in your, in your application. And what I tend to do at this stage is I either create a branch of the code specifically for my own personal setup. Uh, because this means that if I was to change the code at all to get it to work, then I'm not damaging, interfering the master branch. It also means that I have something to compare with. So I create myself a branch and then I run the relevant package managers to install the various things. Now, this is where we get into what I call dependency hell because it really depends on whether or not the dependencies have been, uh, they've been updated frequently, whether the packages exist uh, anymore. If it's got uh, Docker, for instance, it could be that the base images are relying on dependencies that just don't exist anymore. The base image might not even exist anymore. So all of these things I've had to, to deal with in the past, and this process of actually getting it installed on your system does take a long time. I mean, obviously, if the project is nice and small, then it's going to be quicker. But if the project is quite big, then this is going to take a long time. You should have a readme file and you want to be following that to the letter as closely as possible. And you want to be writing down any differences that you've made to the code in order to get it to work. Hopefully this readme file has a section in there about system requirements. So when you do set up your local machine, you can set it up with versions of PHP, versions of Node, that kind of stuff. Okay, any kind of issues you get when you're, you're installing these dependencies, make a note of them. And what I usually do is, is well, I either use a notepad to do some pen and, and paper notes, or what I've been tending to do recently is in my own little personal setup branch, create a audit folder. And in that folder, have your reports and have a markdown file that you can write down notes. The reason why I use markdown is because you can use code blocks, which is great for referencing. So any issues you face, you put it down in this, your own personal readme file, your audit readme file. Okay. So. You've ran all of those things and hopefully all the packages have been installed, but you could still hit issues with your package manager. For example, if it's a PHP application, it might require that certain environment variables are to be set. If they're not uh, defined or described in the readme file, then that's an issue. Write that down. It's basically a, a, a journey of discovery, this. Um, also, there could be permission issues with certain files and folders. So if you hit any of those, write that down as well. And uh, yeah, try and keep doing it until you get to a point where everything has been installed and it's running. At this stage, you should hopefully be able to make a request to your local environment. And that should hopefully bring up a website. If it doesn't, if it doesn't, then again, put down any kind of information into your own audit report. And also, if you are hitting in, uh, issues, make sure you are tailing the logs and report anything in the logs that uh, are throwing any kind of issues. So let's just assume that everything is working and you have a website or an API or whatever it is that you can now access. The tendency here is to just go nuts and click around and it's like a new shiny toy. But what I've been trying to do more recently is to actually take another step back and go, right, we're now going to use auditing tools to audit the code. I want to gain as much foresight with this code as possible. And this is where we're going to be talking about the tools. The first tool I would use is PHP lock. Now, this is a lovely tool. It gives you a, a really nice printout, a report, if you will, of various different measurements and statistics about the code. So, for example, the amount of uh, how, how, how long the code is in terms of line numbers, how big the classes are, how small the classes are, that kind of thing, the average line length of those things. That can give you an indication as to 
like how many classes are in the system and if there is hardly any classes but the classes there they have have a very large line length then that to me will indicate that there's a lot of god classes going on there there's a lot of uh, classes that have too much responsibility so that's an issue Another thing that uh, PHP Lock re reports is cyclomatic complexity, and I'll be talking about that in more detail when we get to the other tools, but that's quite a, a sort of an early warning indication, if you will, of the complexity of the code. So PHP Lock is really, really helpful for giving you measurements of the code. It also tells you things like how, how many comments there are, which is really helpful too. After running PHP lock, I would probably go back to my package manager, say Composer or NPM. This is because these, these managers have the ability to discover outdated packages, which is super useful. So with Composer, you would run Composer update hyphen hyphen dry hyphen run. I think that's the right way, or is it dry run or one word? I can't remember, but this is a fantastic command that will list all of the, the packages that are outdated and the versions that they need to jump to. There's also the outdated command with NPM and yarn as well. So use that too for the front end stuff. Now the, the outdated packages you want to be making a note about the package version jump. Okay. If it's a big jump, then that's a big issue. If, you know, if you're a few major versions behind, that's a big issue. This gives you an indication as to how outdated the application is. Also, you want to be taking a note about the version levels of the frameworks that you're using, and you want to be making sure that they are at least long-term support and still within support. So, Again, all of these notes, put them down in your audit report or in your notepad. After using the package managers, I would take a look at perhaps pdepend. Okay, pdepend is a great way of discovering the, the level of reusability, maintainability of the code. A lot of the graphs that pdepend uh, outputs, they do go over my head, but you do get a feeling for the the size and the complexity of certain areas of the code because it, it it highlights areas that are very difficult to maintain again i i use pdepend i probably don't use it as much as i should do but i use it again at like an early warning system essentially what i'm looking for in all of these tools is a common sort of indication of areas of code that are difficult to manage and maintain. So I must admit, I probably don't use peer-depend as much as I should do, but it's it's really good because it does show you the areas that uh, need improvement. And especially if those are the areas that you're going to be working on. Okay, after peer-depend, then I'll probably use php mess detector. Now this is amazing. This tool is fantastic <laughs> because this gives you various different reports based on various different rule sets and you can configure them as much as you want. Basically PHP mess detector does what it says. It's going to detect mess problems in the code. Now this could range from the the size of the uh, the number of arguments in in a, in certain functions so you could have a threshold to say that functions should only have up to say four arguments anything over that will get raised and flagged it it could even look for things that are a slightly more at a granular level so for instance variables that only have one character in them rather than like actually explaining what the variable is. So here you can get an indication of the readability of the code. But most importantly, I think PHP mess detector detects this thing that I can't say very well, but I'll try cyclomatic complexity. Cyclomatic complexity is a way of discovering the amount or or measuring, I should say, measuring the amount of decision decision points in the code. Okay, so how many ways in and out of the code? So it focuses on things like methods and functions and the different paths within the code, the decision points. Let's say, for example, you have a method 
And that method will return a string, it could return an object, or it could return an array. Now, how did it get to that point? Maybe it also throws an exception. Maybe it calls a completely different function. Maybe it's a gigantic switch statement with nested if statements. You know, I've seen that. It's, it's, it's not fun. So this will highlight those areas and it will say that these, it'll actually give you the, the, the code, the, the file, right? The file and the line numbers, which is super useful. So you can sort of group them together and you can find real bad problem areas. And, and it works on thresholds, as I've mentioned. So you can define the thresholds and anything over a certain threshold than that, you, you know, you could color that. You could have different green, red, and amber lights for various different levels of cyclomatic complexities, various different end paths, various, various different decision points. PHP mess detector is fantastic. I certainly recommend that you use it, not just when you're auditing a legacy pro project that you haven't used before, but just use it before you go to production, because this is fantastic. PHP Mess Detector, I know I'm going on about this, but PHP Mess Detector has before helped me find performance issues where the code has been making so many calls in a recursive manner to itself. And it's just, yeah, it's just, um, it's just fallen over. So I needed to detect where that was. And it was, PHP mess detector that came out on top, which discovered this, this chunk of code, this method, which was just so over bloated. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, so PHP mess detector definitely use. The next one after this is static analysis. So I would use PHP stand. There's lots of static analysis tools out there. It's static because you don't have to run the code. It's not you like auditing the code as it's running, uh, which means that there isn't a performance overhead, which means that you can run this stuff before you actually push to production. So if you're putting it in a pipeline, then definitely look at uh, PHP Stan, definitely look at Mess Detector and, and the other bits and pieces too. So PHP Stan, I should say, it, it gives you, it gives you the ability to audit the code from various different levels. So I think it's from like level one to seven and you can change the levels in the command. So it's going to more vigorously check the code for various different things. Now, these things that it checks, they could be, uh, in your opinion, quite insignificant in the sense that perhaps the, the, the PHP doc block has the wrong return type in it or the, you know, the variable has been declared incorrectly in the doc block, but then it also has more severe uh, issues that it finds such as undefined variables, such as classes that just don't exist, all of that stuff. And I've just thought of another thing that PHP mess detector does. <laughs> I'm so sorry, but this is PHP mess detector also detects unused code. All right. So if there's any dead code in there, that's, that's, that's really super useful. Anyway, back to PHP stand, PHP stand again, is static analysis. It's got various different levels and it's a way that you can audit the code without actually having to run the code because it's static. And what I tend to do is I run it from the lowest level first and then I run it at the highest level first because I want to know if there's lots of issues at the high level and low issues at the bottom level. If there's hardly any issues at uh, the first level. Then what I do is I walk the ladder all the way up to the top. When I get to a point where there is hundreds of errors, then that's where I record all the bits and pieces. The 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 low hanging fruit. I'm I'm not necessarily worried about when I'm taking over a project because that's low hanging fruit. It's the things like you know these classes can't be found. This kind of stuff, um, or the base class has a completely different method signature to the overriding class or method or what have you. Those kind of things are very important to, to discover. Now there's a whole suite of security tools. I'm not going to be talking about them because to be honest, I don't have much experience working with security tools, but I, I just want to give a shout out to things like rips because, uh, rips will audit the code, um, at various different levels of security. So if you're ever working on government stuff, then that's very, very useful to use. I must admit I've never used it before, but there's certainly, 
you should consider security in, in all of these tools. So after PHP Stan, after PHP Mess Detector, after PHP uh, Lock and P depend and your dependency package manager, then I would take a look at a code sniffer. Now this code sniffer will sniff out various different coding style issues. So you could argue that this isn't as important as some of the other things that we've pointed out here, but let's say for example, the there's various different standards in the code. You want to be making sure that it, that it conforms to a particular standard, right? A code sniffer is a way of sniffing out and detecting if things are done in a very weird way. Perhaps there's been multiple developers working on your, on this application and they've left and they've developed it in very different ways. So a code sniffer would be able to analyze that. Now we haven't actually talked about testing and testing is super important. So I would hope that the project has at least PHP unit installed. Um, it might have codeception in there, if, if so, awesome. If there's any tests, then you want to make sure that they run and you want to make sure that you record anything that fails. Maybe the, uh, as the project started, the developers had this uh, great idea of, of testing their work, but then suddenly the workload came on and they couldn't keep up with the tests and the, the features. And unfortunately, the they got out of sync. So you want to make sure that if that is the case, you record all of that information. And also it's a good way to just make sure that everything is installed properly on your machine as well. So you probably should be testing, running those tests probably right early in the stages of, of getting this stuff up and running. But I must admit there are that I've done, I've worked on many more projects that don't have tests than projects that do. So, you know, if, if you've got unit tests, if you've got acceptance tests, if you've got API tests, integration tests, fantastic. But if you don't, then unfortunately it's quite common, <laughs> but uh, you want to be making sure that uh, you record those. Also, if you do have tests, you want to be making sure what hasn't been tested Yes, you could have lots and lots of tests, but they could be testing the low hanging fruit rather than the actual important pieces of code. And you want to be keeping an eye on common areas that these auditing tools actually report on. So let's say, for example, you've got lots of cyclomatic complexity in a specific feature, and you've also got hardly any tests in that area, and you've got uh, issues with, say, huge amounts of arguments being put into the functions within that feature. That is an indication that that feature needs a lot of work. <laughs> so you want to be using these tools as a way of gaining insight to the complexities of the project. Now, depending on how this auditing goes, you could be focusing more, say, on speed. You could be focusing more on security or more on dependencies, depending on how things go in the audit. Uh, you, you've kind of at this point, you've got enough, I think, to gain, gain an insight of the code in general. But if you're uh, seeing any kind of speed issues, then you might want to be looking at certain areas of the code, maybe dealing with things such as flame graphs, using things like uh, cake crash grind. I can't say it very well. Also, you could be using XProf as well for sort of a, a less um, intrusive kind of auditing and analysis, which is really helpful. And they produce graphs and charts as well that you can, you can put into your report too. Now I've mentioned the report. I've mentioned this report thing. What is this all about? Well, if you were to take on the project, then this is going to be your kind of justification as to, you know, your hourly rate or, you know, how much the project is going to be, or, you know, it's going to give you a, a, an indication of what you need to do in order to get, to get this up and running. And in my experience, it could be that, uh, you, you mentioned that, uh, you, you've had some issues. Sometimes the client might want this report back. So you, you know, you send the report to them. Um, but sometimes in my experience, there can be a long time before actually taking on a project to audit to actually taking on a project to, to, to build. So this report is something that you can look at historically 
when you do decide, if you do decide to take on the project, to say, okay, yeah, this is how I need to set this up. This, These are all the changes that I had to make. Plus, you have your own branch now. You have your features setup branch or features install branch that you've created. Don't push this up to production whatsoever. This is for you. This is your own little safe space, if you will, to get this up and running. Um, and then this gives you, like I said, a level of confidence as to how you want to approach the, this legacy application. Now there's many other tools out there. I haven't, I haven't mentioned all of them, all the tools that I use. There's lots of other tools that I use, but they are kind of the main ones that I use frequently. And as I said, depending on the complexities or the areas of the code that uh, have been flagged up by these auditing tools, you might want to go into different directions and, and so on and so forth. But essentially you end up with this report that you can, you can read and understand a technical report about the audit of the code. And before I go, I just want to say that these auditing tools, don't just use them when you start a project. See if you can actually get these installed in a pipeline before it gets pushed to staging or production and run these tools and make sure that, you know, everything is at a high quality. You want to be using these tools to make you a better developer. Happy coding, everybody. See you again next time. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>